I am not the first, and will certainly not be the last, to posit that the modern world as it stands currently appears to be on or nearing the unpleasant side of a Faustian bargain. When this bargain was made is a matter of contention between various strands of the conservative movement in the West, but I put it at the feet of the accepted conclusions of the Enlightenment and subsequent liberal movements. But explaining this will require more unpacking than I can adequately achieve in one video, so for now I will simply focus on part of the economics which make up this Faustian bargain. At the core of classical economics, upon which all further models and predictions must be made, are a number of assumptions. Two in particular ought to be under the microscope a touch more. Regarding consumers. That the consumer automatically prefers more to less, and that preferences are largely, largely exogenous. Neither of these are particularly offensive, taken alone, but how they interact with the rest of the discipline creates problems further down the line. And so for that reason, to some extent, a reconsideration of these assumptions may be necessary to perhaps counteract the damage being done. It is well known within the field that these assumptions may not be true, but assembling the behavioural economists into something resembling a cohesive school with associated models has proven an elusive goal, so we are left to collate these findings into a simple collection. Likewise, I am aware of why such assumptions exist, as it would be difficult to build predictive models without some fairly simplistic grounding. The issue then is twofold. They are indeed not true, or at least untrue enough that modelling adherence to them creates damaging long-term consequences, and thus, that this grounding is actually too simplistic. All of this is to say that if we accept, as economics tends to, that preferences are derived from outside the sphere of economics, then we must conclude that the subject is in itself an insufficient means of describing how economic consumption takes place, other than to describe how resources are ordered once the relevant inputs are all in place. By which I mean. We have a set of preferences, a group of consumers, a set of resources for distribution, a marketplace, and a means of transformation. Most of these items are very much tangible, but one is quite clearly not. Perhaps it is not hard to see then, from this further perspective, why they have for so long not been of interest to economics. To quickly bring in an additional concept then, more or less however the terms are specifically defined, in aggregate these preferences will be dictated by culture in turn dictating the utility gained from consumer goods and services. In previous times, this had been something implicitly accepted by the fact that scholarly economics existed largely as a subject under the umbrella of moral philosophy, thus acknowledging that what consumers ought to want is of primary importance, with all other concerns being relegated to either secondary, to the moral implications, or as part of governing policy. This itself is, and was, clearly an insufficient means of observation, but with the arrival of the field of economics in roughly its current form, combined with how it interacts with people's lives in a democratic society, it has taken on a certain hegemony, far above its previous ordering. Consequently, economic concerns and the maximization of economic outputs has been raised in priority of vastly above many other economic and international concerns. Incidentally, this is where one of our assumptions comes in, because by economic concerns we are almost universally referring to the attainment of greater economic growth, or to put it another way, providing more goods and services under the assumption that doing so will automatically grant more utility, though admittedly this is the lesser of the two issues, but I digress. So what does this mean for our topic? Well, both implicit in the study, and as received by government and the public, is the idea that economic growth is good and to be strived for, which, again, as economics is valued so highly, means that economic growth will be valued more highly than other concerns. This creates a tendency all other things being equal, to implicitly promote the goods and services which grant the greatest economic benefit. In combination with democratic terms and elections, this becomes a priority to value greater short-term economic gains more highly than other concerns. All of this means that, as preferences are considered ex exogenous, they are not considered in the economic realm, and with the rise of economics as relative hegemony, they are therefore largely not considered. The exception to this is where selection constitutes a negative externality which is usually also structured as an economic consequence. Consumers have therefore been left to gradually deplete a stock of economic morality, as I will put it, with regards to preferences. Though as an aside, this also applies in places to the labour market as well, where moralistic employment practices have been gradually rolled back in favour of a more pure economic focus. Tangibly, this means a shortening of time preferences, an immediate but temporary gratification over long-term fulfilment. In both cases, this is because they both represent an economic boon now, rather than later, or even a non-economic benefit. 
Of course, in the context of history, these trends have not been unfolding in a linear fashion. Instead, much of the West has oscillated between periods of legislated morality and relative laissez-faire attitudes, both in terms of economics and societal morality. But an important point here is that it's been legislated morality, rather than something more emphasising an individual will-based abstentions. As such, although this may have given some semblance of an impression that these preferences had been altered, it did nothing to refill the stock of economic morality, as I termed it previously, but perhaps merely reduced the depleting flow. So, what could be done to reverse this? Although, again, it has its own problems, it seems to me that economics ought to return to its position as a subordinate to the concerns which inform it, albeit in a form which keeps it intact as a distinct academic entity. To clarify, not that economics should be studied and practiced by philosophers, but that there be an acknowledgement, both at the policy level and at the academic level, that preference formation is not merely external to economics, but that preference formation is foundationally important to economics in a virtuous society, and therefore that cultural concerns must be elevated beyond economic concerns.